All right, a more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. The, uh, this is lesson number eight in that series, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, part two that we're uh, talking about. Uh, I've said that Paul uses the divine, uh, or the device of contrast rather, in highlighting the differences between the person who walks in the flesh and the person who walks by the Spirit. Uh, Paul is doing this in order to respond to false teachers who insist that maintaining one's perfection uh, in Christ before God required adherence to man-made religious rules and prohibitions. He says that to remain perfect before God requires that we walk in the Spirit and not keep man-made rules. And he begins by describing the life or the walk of the unspiritual person and he gives a sampling of the things that this kind of life would, uh, would produce. That was all we talked about that last week. Next, he describes the virtues and the qualities produced in the life of one who follows the Spirit. Now, last time uh, I explained that the fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Spirit as we submit our will to Him. Remember I said, we, we don't produce the fruit of the Spirit. We don't kind of grit our teeth and say, right, I'm going to produce self-control or I'm going to produce peace. Of my, you know, it's the Spirit that produces, uh, produces it in us. Uh, our task is to submit to the Spirit. And the thing we do do is submit to the Spirit and we talked about how do we do that? How do we practice submitting to the Spirit? And we said last week, uh, by submitting to His word, and by submitting to His power, His influence in our lives, by submitting to His ministry in our lives. So our active bending and submission to the Holy Spirit's will in these ways will produce the Spirit's fruit in our lives as a natural outcome. Now, in verse 22, Paul briefly refers to some of the results or the fruit that submission to or walking by the Spirit will produce. And the very first of these he mentions is love, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, in Galatians, Paul only gives us a sampling of the things that the Holy Spirit creates in us. But we have to go somewhere else in the Bible to understand the nature of these things. He just lists them, you know, love, joy, but you know, he just lists them, but he doesn't explain them. We have to go to other places in the New Testament to get explanation of these particular things. As far as love is concerned, this first fruit of the Spirit is described in detail in another one of Paul's letters, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So in order to explain what Paul means by love as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, we need to switch gears here and go to 1 Corinthians and put the passage there, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, into context. Um, just a little background on 1, Corin uh, on 1 Corinthians so we'll understand why he talks about love. In chapters 1 to 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul has been providing a series of instructions in response to the many problems and issues that were present in the church at Corinth. From issues of unity, uh, sexual immorality, to instruction on marriage and the proper use of Christian liberty and uh, the proper order in worship, all those subjects he kind of talks about in 1 Corinthians. And so Paul is running down a checklist of problems that have cropped up among the brethren at Corinth. Um, he finishes discussing the proper function and the use of spiritual gifts in chapter 12, and he ends the chapter with the statement that he proposes that they follow a more excellent way, the way of love. Now Paul is not suggesting that the following description of love was something in itself to be pursued to the exclusion of other things like unity among the leaders and the teachers, or sexual purity, or peace in marriage, or enlightened Christian living, or proper worship, or proper use of spiritual gifts. You know, he's, you know, you, all those things were important. His point in directing them to a more excellent way was to encourage them to pursue these things with the character of love that he will so eloquently describe in chapter 13. So, in Galatians, he explains that the only way to cultivate love is to walk by the, or submit to the, Holy Spirit. 
in Corinthians, he actually describes in detail the nature of this fruit of the Holy Spirit that is created in us. So in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes the character of Christian love and how different it is in comparison to other types of affection and affinity that human beings experience. So we're going to talk about the character of Christian love. If you're looking in your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 13. So in describing the character of love, Paul reveals three important elements about love that makes it the excellent way that a Christian should pursue all things. I do all things in love. I pursue my marriage in Christian love. I pursue my relationships in Christian love. I, I approach my work in Christian love, okay? So three things he says about Christian love. First of all, Christian love is essential is essential. He says, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I mean, you can, you can have the trappings of religion. You can even display dynamic signs. But if you don't love, you're missing the essence of what Christianity is all about. You know, it's like a, a car with lovely interior and flashy colors and lots of controls and buttons on the dashboard, but no motor under the hood. Imagine, <laughs> imagine you have a beautiful car. I had a friend like that once. <laughs> I was walking down the street and there were two of my buddies, Butchie and Dominic, and they were sitting in this car and the music was playing, you know, I don't know. This is a long time ago, obviously, and they were just sitting there like this, you know, with their arms you know, out the windows. And I said, yeah, cool car, you know. I said, let's go for a drive. Oh no, we can't go for a drive. Why not? I said, well, the motor's broken. It doesn't, it doesn't go. It, it won't go into drive. I said, you mean to say the only thing works is the radio? Yep. <laughs> it's just that this car sitting there and they'd get in and listen to the radio and talk to people as they go by. Well, you know, how useless is that? You know, Paul is saying, you, know, all the, you can have all the trappings of religion, but if you don't have love, then it, it's useless. It doesn't, it doesn't work. He uses three examples to demonstrate that love is essential in Christianity. And so in the first verse, you know, as I read, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Even if one displays miraculous signs but doesn't love, his signs point to nothing. They're useless, he says. Signs are to verify that God is near, but without love the signs are meaningless. God is not where love is not. Jesus rebuked those who thought that their ability to perform signs was enough. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, you know, don't the people at the judgment say, well, Lord, Lord, didn't, didn't we perform signs? And does he say, I, go away from me, I never knew you. In the second verse, of Corinthians 13, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And so knowledge, the ability to preach or prophecy or strong faith is no substitute for love. Paul says that the object of teaching, the result of knowledge, the fruit of one's faith, is love from a pure heart. First Timothy 1 verse 5, that's a quote. All of the teaching that we receive is to create love in our hearts and if we don't love, we've obviously not put what we've learned into practice or whoever is teaching us is not teaching us properly. And then in verse three, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So even zeal and generosity are misguided if not motivated by love. People will die for ideals. They'll donate millions to causes that may help others. But if they do it because of pride or misguided loyalty, their sacrifice is useless. Their only giving out of love is honored by God. So God looks into a person's heart and if his power and knowledge and works are not grounded in love, they have no value in the sight of God. They may have value in our own sight or in the sight of men, but in the end, it's what God sees that's important. So love is essential, right? Next thing he says about love, love is visible. Christian love is 
visible, verses uh, four to seven, let's read, he says, love is patient, love is kind and is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account wrongs suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There are some things like power and faith and works which are legitimate if based on unseen love without, within a person's heart. But there are also visible attributes that are unmistakable signs that a person has love. And Paul gives, a, again, a sample of these things. It's not an exhaustive list, but he gives a list of the things that you can see in the life of a person who genuinely loves with Christian love. He mentions, I'll, we'll go over a few, patience, right? Patience, biblical patience, a willingness to bear with other people's meanness, weaknesses, and offenses without losing our loving attitude. Some people think patience is, you know, you, 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 somebody says offensive things to you, or you know, meanness, or, 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 or weaknesses, and the offense of others. They think patience is that those things don't affect you. Oh, I must be impatient because that person's, you know, whatever they're doing is, is, you know, is stirring me up. You know. Well, no, I mean, we're human beings. Of course we're affected by what other people do. Patience is being affected, uh, you know, having those feelings without losing our loving attitude without allowing their behavior to change our behavior. That's what patience is. He says love is kind, kindness, the doing and the saying of good things. Love is not jealous. We know what jealousy is, envious of another's blessings, fearful of losing our blessings. The basis of jealousy is fear. That, 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 that ugly feeling we have inside there when we're jealous, terrible feeling, right? I mean, you actually feel the jealousy. It just, ooh, it's just, just right in your heart, right? That feeling, what is that feeling? Well, it's fear. It's fear that that other person is going to be better than us, or that other person is going to have what we've got, or that other person is going to take what we have, or whatever. Love is not jealous. Why? <laughs> because my, what I have is given to me by God. And God is the one that permits me to keep what I have, strengthens me to keep what I have, continues to bless me if I lose what I have. I mean, if I'm depending just on me, uh-oh, there's going to be a lot of fear in my life because just me, that's not a lot, not a lot to go on. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, boastful, haughty, proud. A Couple more, does not act unbecomingly, to be unthoughtful, to be uncaring. Don't we, don't we like that about people? They, you know, people talk about someone that they knew and they say, oh, he was, uh, she was, he was such a thoughtful person. They remembered the little things. They, they cared about me, they asked, did you ever meet somebody and you, know, you have a friend or somebody that you know or somebody in your family and whenever you're with them, if you have a one hour conversation with them, it's all about what they are telling you about themselves? Themselves, their family, their things, their kids, their job, their hopes, their dreams, nothing. Nowhere in that one hour is the question, so how are you doing? <laughs> How's your family? What do you think about this? No, no, it's just a monologue. You're just an audience. Love does not act like that. Love does not seek its own, he says, selfishness. The bottom line is, how is this going to affect me? What advantage is there in this thing for me? Christian love asks the question, what's in it for us? How will this affect us? How will this affect the person that I love? Is not provoked, is not easily provoked. A bad temper, 
uh, oversensitive. You know, people get hurt too easily. Uh, always ready to take offense, always ready to be offended. Christian love isn't like that. It gives a wide latitude. There's a, there's a lot of steps before you consider yourself offended. Uh, does not count wrongs. That's revenge, right? Get even attitude. That was, that was my favorite emotion <laughs> as a young man before I got, became a Christian. Getting even, I would even say it. I would tell people, sure, good, good for you, it's okay, you did your thing, it's all right, just remember, I'll get you back. <laughs> Look over your shoulder, because I'll get you back. I love doing that. That's not of love at all. That's not of Christ at all. Some more he puts, Rejoices in right, loves to see the right thing done. Loves to see the right thing done even by the people we don't necessarily like or our enemies. We need to be careful to re be rejoicing a little too much there if our enemy stumbles. You know, God does not take pleasure in the death of anyone, any sinner. Love bears all things. In other words, the capacity to suffer much without complaint. I mean, everybody suffers, everybody suffers. You just take five minutes and talk to somebody and just get into their life a little bit, you'll find out that they're suffering in their life. Children who have died, whatever. You know, they've gone through a bout of cancer, they've lost their jobs, or, you know, everybody suffers. The difference is not everybody complains as much as others. Love bears all things. Again, why? Because we can bring those burdens to God. It isn't complaining when we bring it to God, it's prayer. Believes all things. In other words, love is not suspicious. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're gullible, but you're not overly suspicious. What do you want? Somebody does something nice for you, what do you want? What's this all about? You know, instead of just <laughs> saying, well, thank you. So my mother used to say, just say thank you. But well, I don't know why the so-and-so gave me this. Doesn't matter, you don't, you don't have to know why, just say thank you. Hopes all things, he says. In other words, Christian love isn't pessimistic or negative. Christian love puts difficult issues and questions into God's hands. You know, some people, some people their, their go-to reaction is no. <laughs> it's their go-to place. Anything comes up, they, they press the no button right away. When I was a, a salesman, again, many years ago for a pharmaceutical company, and my job was to go to you know, different companies and talk to the buyers. And, I, and there were some buyers, they had what I call the no face. I mean, I just had to look at their face. I hadn't even shown them the product yet, you know, nothing, but I knew it was going to be no. They had a no face. And, and others, you, know, you could, you could kind of tell, well, you know, I got a chance with this guy or this, this lady. You know, somehow the, their, their look seems open. A Christian love doesn't have a no face for everything. It, we can say no to stuff. But we consider first. It's not necessarily our go-to position. Christian love endures all things. A willingness to bear with injury and inconvenience and hardship without losing our loving attitude. Very much like patience. Usually endurance has to do more with uh, events, things that happen, so on and so forth. Patience has to do with people. It's the same thing that we're exercising. We exercise patience with people you know, we bear under for different situations. You know. Have you ever built a house? <laughs> Have you ever worked with a contractor to build a house? You understand what bearing under is if you've ever had to do that. They've tiled half your bathroom with the tile that was supposed to go in the kitchen. Yeah. 
you need to bear under at that moment. <laughs> so when we see these things in people, what we see, the, the list that I've, we've talked about, is the character of Christian love. Now, note that these things are not based on emotion, how one feels about something, not based on attraction, like sexual love, for example. These things that I mentioned are not based on mutual interest and service, like the love that exists between friends or family. Not based on relationships. No, the love that Paul talks about and describes as Christian love is based on a decision, not a feeling. We decide that this is going to be the nature of our character, of our love. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, directed by the word of God, the Lord creates this love in our hearts a little at a time as each day goes by. It's a decision. You know, I decide I'm not going to have the no face. I decide in advance that it's not all going to be about me. I make those decisions ahead of time. We're not born with this kind of love. We cultivate it through prayer and practice and perseverance in the trials that we experience. That's one of the basic reasons that God allows us to suffer trials so that we can cultivate Christian love. It's very hard to cultivate love during the good times. The money's rolling in, everybody's healthy, you know. It's all good. That's not when we cultivate patience or forbearance or you know, we don't cultivate those loving skills during the good times. During the good times, what is it that we cultivate? Well, gratitude, joyfulness, thanksgiving, praise. You know, what do I do when things are just so good, I'm about to burst? You know? Well, I, I give thanks. I go into prayer and I give thanks and I praise God for it. You know? There's closure in prayer. Why do you think that some people, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but it's a, a, contribu a contribution to their feeling. Why do you think some people, you look at them and they, have, they seem to have everything and they kill themselves? <laughs> because they can't, they can't uh, uh, they can't justify in their own minds why they got everything so good. They're bursting with everything's going great, but they got nowhere to go with that. Christians, we've got somewhere to go with that. We go to God with that. Thank you, Lord. I, this is so wonderful, Lord. You're so good to me. Thank you. Praise you. I'm going to do this over here to share my, 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 the, the goodness. But if all you got is good and money and rich and fame and more good and more applause and more this and more that, but you've got nowhere to go with that, that becomes a burden to you. And heaven forbid if you lose it. <laughs> heaven forbid if you lose it. So we've said that the more excellent way, love is A, essential, be visible in the Christian character, and number three, it's eternal. Verses eight to 12, he says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. So this passage raises many questions as to the meaning and the reference of the word perfect. When the perfect comes in verse 10, some people say that this refers to the completion of the New Testament canon. The perfect is the perfect revelation, the complete revelation. Others say this refers to Christ and His return when the perfect one comes. 
But when we focus on this particular verse to the exclusion of the passage as a whole, we kind of lose the sense of what Paul is saying here. Paul has been describing the character of Christian love. And in this final section, he makes the point that love is eternal and this is its most important feature. Because he says in verse eight, love never fails. Well, never uh, you know, points to eternity. And then he says, uh, love never falls away or is always present. This is another way of translating that passage. So the reason for this is that love is from God is God's essential nature. This is why it will always exist. The Corinthians have been focusing their attention on the temporary things, those things that are going to pass away in time, you know, the gift that they received of knowledge or the ability to speak in tongues. You know, Paul is saying those things are going, away, are going to go away in time. And the Corinthians have put the emphasis on the means rather than the end. You know, the spiritual gifts and the abilities that they had were, were there only to enable them to get started in the faith. They were not you know, a goal in themselves. So he urges them to grow up spiritually and recognize what the true objective is. And that objective is the character of love that he has been describing. Understand, in 1 Corinthians there were people who could speak in tongues and who could heal and who could do these type of things. And they were using these things you know, to create groups. My people, the, his people, and there was division and infighting and people were trying to get gifts and you know, thinking, I've got this gift, therefore I'm higher than everybody else. You know, it was going to their heads. And what Paul is saying here is, you guys are missing the point here. Those, those, those gifts, they're temporary. They're just to get you going. Okay? The goal is love. You're missing the point here. So their true maturation will come when they recognize that love is the objective. And it is the objective because it is the essence of their experience with God. So he encourages them to realize that love will be the everlasting experience of Christianity, not the temporary gifts of prophecy or tongues or other things. And then he finishes the passage with an extraordinary statement concerning faith, hope, and love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he says, but now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. So after describing the character of love, Paul places this virtue, this experience at the pinnacle of spiritual values. This is his conclusion after stating the various qualities of love, but Paul doesn't answer the question, why? You know, he says, the greatest of these is love. But he doesn't say, well, yeah, why, Paul? Why, why is love the greatest? Why is it better than faith and hope? What is it about love that exalts it above these cardinal qualities necessary for Christian life? Well, in Galatians, we go back to Galatians now, Paul mentions love as the first and preeminent quality and result that comes from walking in the Spirit. In Corinthians, he goes one step further by exalting Christian love uh, far above faith and hope. Why is it the greatest? Well, let me try to answer that question as best I can. Love is the greatest because it is eternal. Faith and hope are necessary to bring us to salvation and maintain our spiritual lives while we are here on earth. Obedient faith puts us into Christ. Galatians 3, those who are baptized into Christ, right? So obedient faith puts us into Christ. Constant hope maintains our faith. But once we reach heaven, faith and hope will no longer be necessary. You ever think about that? No faith in heaven, no hope in heaven. We will see God face to face, Revelation 24, 4. No need to believe as true we will actually be in His presence. I, don't need, I won't need faith in heaven. I'll, I'll see what I was hoping for. And we will also experience the glorified body. In other words, the body without sin or death. We will no longer hope for it. We will have it. 
If your dad promised you a new bike for your birthday and on your birthday that bike is wheeled in you know, with streamers and everything, all that you were hoping for, for the, the two months before your birthday, you were hoping to get that bike and you, oh, you, you didn't have it yet, then on your birthday there's the bike. Well, there's no more hoping, you've got it. So we're hoping to you know, lose this sinful body of ours and have it replaced with a glorious body that will be able to exist in the dimension with God. We're hoping for it, we see glimpses of it, but we don't have it yet. But once we have it, no more hope, we'll have it. In heaven, only love will remain. Only the context and experience of love will remain. So in heaven, we will love God perfectly because we will know Him and will do His will perfectly. Won't that be wonderful? <laughs> we will love ourselves perfectly because we will be sinless. There will be no shame, no regret, nothing to dislike about ourselves. Imagine all the time we've spent in this world not liking ourselves. <laughs> that won't happen in heaven. We will love others perfectly because Satan will no longer divide us. We will all be together in Christ, perfectly suited and united in perfect peace and love. So love is the greatest because there'll be nothing left to respond to in faith and nothing left to hope for. Only love will remain to experience and to rejoice in forever. That's why it's the cardinal virtue that we try to cultivate here. The more we understand about Christian love, the better we have a taste of heaven and what it's going to be like. Love is the greatest because God is love. You know, John didn't say God is faith or God is hope. He said God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Love is what motivates his actions and defines his being. Love is the greatest virtue because to love is to know God intimately and to do His ultimate will. You see, faith believes what God says, hope expects what God promises, but love does what God does. And so faith and hope are the best characteristics of the human heart, but when a person loves, they become spiritual people and the true children of God, 1 John 4.1. So all religious people believe in hope. Only godly people love as God loves. Love is the greatest because it's the defining characteristic of a spirit-filled person. So the true faith and a genuine hope are expressed in Christian love. Without love, faith and hope are worthless. And then one more, love is the greatest because love is the power of life. It isn't our faith that has the power to save us, it is God's love that saves us. Faith is our response to His love. What does John say? For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, John 3.16. So love is what motivated God to set the entire plan into motion. You know, why did God save us? Because He loved us. It isn't our faith or hope that draws people to Christ. It's the love of Christ we show that brings them to faith and hope and eventually their own love for Christ and others. You know, people are not impressed with you if you spout off a lot of you know, uh, scriptures by heart, but you don't have a loving attitude. You know? the, both are necessary. I'm not saying it's not necessary to know the word, of course it is. And the better you know it, the better and more effective you are in making your witness. But you undermine your, well, we undermine our witness if we undermine what we know about the word by an, by an attitude that lacks love. Very important. The disciples had favor with all the people, it says, Acts 2.47, largely due to the love that others witness among themselves. What does Jesus say? By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Imagine that. John 13.35, that's, that's, the, that's the defining characteristic from Jesus' own lips. 
So there would be no faith or hope if it wasn't for love. Love was first and love will be there last and forever. Love was the power that created us. It was the power that saved us. It's the power that sustains us. It's the power that identifies us. And love will be the power that resurrects, glorifies, and exalts us to the right hand of God forever. Do we understand what it is that God has planned for us? You know, why, why, why are we getting that glorified body? You know, like the guys who go out into space, the, the astronauts, they have to have a special suit on, right? Because once they leave the capsule, the spaceship, right? If they were just in their regular bodies, they couldn't survive in that. You know, they, they, would, they would, I don't know what they would do. They would die, no, no oxygen, you know? They, so they have to have a special suit to exist. So heaven, what we call heaven, it's a dimension, it's a place, it's a, it's a spiritual dimension. This body cannot survive in that dimension. And so the promise of a glorified body, think of it as a spacesuit. You know? We get a new glorified body so that it can exist in the, spiritual, in the purely spiritual dimension. But what will we do there? What will happen there? What will be our position there? We will participate in the Godhead. <laughs> Doesn't Paul say that we will reign with him? That we will be at his right hand? Jesus, the right hand of God the Father and the Spirit? It's as if God has made room within the Godhead for us. Think about that. And our loving attitude is the beginning of the glimmer of the glorified body that we will possess. And so to summarize, the Holy Spirit creates love in us in the following way. He reveals God's love for us in the gospel and engenders our faith, which leads our, to our salvation. He maintains our hope of heaven through His loving ministry to us each day. And He creates the loving image and character of Christ in us as we submit to His word and His will and His way throughout our Christian lives. And finally, He'll complete our perfect renewal of Christ in us when He separates us from our sinful flesh at death and He equips us with a glorified body at the resurrection. And so walking by the Spirit begins the process of creating perfect love in us. The resurrection will complete it in the end. All right, that's Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, part two. We have one more lesson in this series, so I hope you see you next time. Thank you very much for your attention.